Hallelujah. The word of God for today, launching point wise, is found in the gospel according to Luke chapter 7. I will read a part of one verse, verse 9, from the New International Version. I'll be preaching from the New International Version, and this is the version you'll see on the screen. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. I want to preach from the subject, the man who amazed Jesus. The man who amazed Jesus. I was amazed when, as a little boy, my dad took me to my first Pope Air Force Base open house. And when we got out there, there were a whole lot of people bunched up trying to get a view of these beautiful planes. And I watched the Thunderbirds perform their aerial gymnastics. They'd fly towards one another, and it looked like they were going to crash. And at the last minute, they would turn. And that amazed me. I was also amazed by those big C-130 planes, Hercules, they called them. And it looked like you could put a whole house in the plane. And they did a display what, and would allow us to see the plane take off. And I'm thinking, uh, how in the world is that big old plane going to get off the ground? But it got up off that ground, lifted up, and it's something how small they look in the sky. But when you have the opportunity to board one, to see how large they are, that, that amazed me. I was amazed last Sunday night when the Cleveland Cavaliers, traveled to the home court of the Golden State Warriors and won the NBA championship after being down three games to one. <laughs> I got a text from my deacon, Deacon WC, saying if you want to learn how to play basketball, turn to the book of James, James LeBron. I, I was amazed. I was amazed. I was amazed. I was amazed by what we, what I experienced at the nation's capital just a few Sundays, a few uh, days ago. The White House, the Capitol building, the Martin Luther King Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Vietnam Memorial, the Arlington Cemetery. I, I was amazed by all that we saw, the agri uh, thinking about the hands that built it, but not only the hands that built it, but knowing that Benjamin Banneker, a black man, was one behind the designing the entire capital city. All those kinds of things we saw that amazed me. I was even amazed by the way our tour bus driver whipped that big bus around everywhere we went. I, I was amazed. I, I was amazed. I, I suppose if I pass this microphone around, gave each person an opportunity to talk about the things that you are amazed with, we'd get all kinds of answers. I thought about doing that, and I said, no, I would never get the mic back, so that'll be for another time. But my question is, is there anybody here today who's amazed by God? Amen. Amazed by God. There's a hymn that we sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. There's another song that says, Amazing Grace shall always be my song of praise, for it was grace that brought my liberty. I cannot tell just why Christ came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my knees. I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous, how amazing the grace that caught my fallen soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. There's another one that says, oh Lord my God, 
When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hand have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great, how amazing thou art, how great thou art. There's another one I love to hear the young people sing. What a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before him. Y'all know that song, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. But then there's another one. It focuses on the amazing name of Jesus. 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 There's just something about that name master savior jesus like the fragrance after the rain jesus 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms shall all pass away but there's something about that name Give him praise, give, give him praise, give him praise. Yes. These hymns reflect the heart of a person who was amazed, who was astonished, who was surprised, reverently startled concerning who God is and concerning what God has done. Are you amazed by the thought of who God is? Are you amazed by the thought of what God has done in your life? Are you amazed that Jesus loves you? Yes, you. So much that he intentionally died for you. I, I would certainly like to follow the flow of this fantastic fact. But as we jump into today's text, this time it's not about people expressing their amazement concerning Jesus. No, not, not this time. This time we are invited into a scene where Jesus is amazed concerning something rare he sees in this particular man. This man amazed Jesus. The question is, what was it about this man that amazed Jesus? Let's back up to chapter 7, verse 1, and see if we can find out. Beginning at verse 1, the text says, When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and Heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. What do we know about this man based on the few verses we just read? First thing we know is that he's a high-ranking man. He's a high-ranking man. Can the church say high-ranking? He. He's a high-ranking man. He is a centurion. He is a Roman officer. And when you look at that word centurion, you see within that word century. And when you think of century, you think of 100, which means that this Roman officer had authority over 100 soldiers. He had rank. He had military status. He had military clout. Anybody who knows anything about military knows that there is a ranking structure. In the Army, there is the E-1, the E-2, the private, the E-3, PFC, specialist, book sergeant, staff sergeant, first sergeant, master sergeant, first sergeant, uh, sergeant major, command sergeant major. That's, that's the enlisted structure. Then you have the officer structure where you have the uh, second lieutenant, first lieutenant, Captain, Major, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Full Bird Colonel, General, you have this ranking structure. And the reality is the higher the rank, 
the more authority you have. And the more authority you have, you tell others what to do. They don't tell you what to do. So this Roman centurion is a high-ranking man. He has a lot of clout, military status, a lot of power, but that's not what amazed Jesus. Have you thought about that? Jesus is not oppressed, impressed with our rank. More about that later. But we also know that he is an honorable man. Can the church say honorable? The Jewish elders esteemed him highly, although he's not one of them. Let's remember that there are tensions between Jews and Gentiles. There are tensions specifically between the Jews and the Romans because the Romans conquered Israel militarily speaking. The, the Romans occupied their land and so the only thing Israel wanted Rome to do was leave. Have you ever had termites at your house? You don't want termites to hang around your house too long because they'll eat up everything and leave your house in ruins. Okay, anybody ever had bad company? You ever had bad company that came over your house and didn't want to leave? You, this is how Rome was in the eyes of Israel. There were tremendous tensions between them. So this centurion, for all practical purposes, is an outsider. Can a church say outsider? But the Jews value him because he sincerely loves their nation. How do we know he sincerely loves their nation? Because he built their synagogue. And we ought to just park the car right there because if somebody showed up and said, we want to build y'all a whole new church, and I, we're gonna, I'm going to finance it, you don't have to worry about taking up a building fund offering, Somebody in here would get excited. Somebody would say, but if you found out that that person used to belong to the Ku Klux Klan, you might have some kind of problem with that. We need to understand that there was tensions between the Romans and the Israelites, but this particular centurion built a synagogue for the Jews in Capernaum. He's a high-ranking Roman officer. He didn't have to do it, but he did. How many of you know that there are things that people might do for for you and they really don't have to do it that's why we got to learn how to say thank you can somebody just say thank you yeah that's all we got to learn how to do is just say thank you he didn't have to do it but he did so in the eyes of these jewish leaders this honorable man had earned the right to have his request fulfilled by jesus but nobody can earn the right to get anything from Jesus because grace is unmerited favor. Aren't you glad that we don't have to earn the right to reach out to Jesus? Aren't you glad that grace is God's unmerited favor? Aren't you glad that God looks beyond who we are and he does for us what we can't do for ourselves, especially when we can't earn it? It doesn't matter how much military rank we have. It doesn't matter how much power we have. It doesn't matter how much money we have in the bank. God's grace looks beyond all that. But this man built them a synagogue, and he treated them nicely. So he's an honorable man, but this is not what amazed Jesus. We also know that he is a hurting man hurting he's hurting because his servant is deathly ill the high-ranking officer was not so high that he could not feel compassion for his servant I want to spend a few seconds here because some people get a little bit of power get a little bit of position and then all they want to do is fly in the clouds and don't pay attention to other people who might not have all that rank, might not have all that clout, might not have all that education. But this centurion had all that rank, but he cared about his servant. Uh, this is something that we need to pay attention to because in those days, this was not unheard of. It was not unheard of for a high-ranking official to have 
a loving relationship with a lowly servant. This particular servant meant a whole lot to this particular captain of this 100 red, uh, soldier regiment. And he could have been in a situation where the captain, where the centurion could have said, well, move you out the way, bury you before you die, and bring the next one on. But he was not so high that he could not stoop down. That sounds like Jesus to me. Aren't you glad that he's not so high that he can't come down and minister to us and see about us? There are people in our lives that we care about so much that when they hurt, we hurt. Is there anybody in your life who you care about that when they hurt, you hurt? I, I, I can call the roll if you have taking notes on those sermon note pages we put in the pew, why don't you just write down some people in your life? Maybe they're going through something right now. Or maybe they're not going through anything, but you have such a connection with them that when they are going through something, you are going through something. When, when my family's not well, I'm not well. When I find out, when someone shares with us that they're going through something, hospitalized or something like that, I'm not well because they're not well, and I'm not going to be well until I see them get well. God gives us grace to keep going, but the reality is there are some people in our lives that when they hurt, we hurt. I remember my son got really ill. We were afraid for what he was going through, and I watched him panting for air. I watched him tossing and turning, and, and I said to him, if I could take your place, I'd be glad to do it. And I wasn't just talking to hear myself talk. I really meant that because I don't want to see the people I love going through anything. This centurion was hurting. He, he had compassion. His compassion is to be commended. His ability to feel his servants hurt is to be commended. But it's not what amazed Jesus. So what else do we know about this man? Picking up at verse 6, the text says, So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. So we also know that the centurion is a humble man. Can the church say humble? He's, he's humble. Re remember that this Roman centurion is a high-ranking officer. He understands military order. He understands the chain of command. He is used to giving orders to those of lower rank. But notice the rank he ascribes to Jesus in verse 6. Lord. Did y'all catch that? He, 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 knows, he looks at himself. He says, I might be the captain of an army. I might be a major. I, I, I might be a, a lieutenant colonel. I, I might be a full bird colonel. I might even be a general. I, I might be the president. But when I look at myself and I think about my ranking, my rank means nothing when I look to Jesus because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's master of all. And I want to just pause for a moment up in here and encourage somebody. You might be nervous about what's going on in your life. You might be nervous about what's going to happen in November concerning who's going to be elected the next president. But you don't have to be nervous about any of that because whoever gets elected still has to bow their knee to Jesus. And so when I think about the fact that I serve Jesus. I don't get upset and uptight about what anybody can do to me. You ought not be upset about what people can do to you if Jesus is your Lord. Did y'all hear what I said? I said, if Jesus is your Lord. Now, if he's not your Lord, you ought to be nervous. You ought to shake in your boots. Yes, when Britain pulled out the other day, you ought to be nervous. You ought to be nervous when you wake up. You ought to be nervous when you hear the thunder and lightning outside. You ought to be nervous when you see a bear walk across the... Well, if you see a bear walk across the backyard, you better be a little nervous. But if Jesus is your Lord, 
You don't have to get bent out of shape about what people can do. Here, this high-ranking official ascribes to Jesus. He says of Jesus, he says, Lord, and you can't get no higher than that. And this is humility. A centurion also humbled himself in the sense that due to the Jewish mindset of the time, Jesus could have been considered unclean had he entered the house of a Gentile. So this man did not want to create unnecessary drama for Jesus. How thoughtful that is. He didn't want to create unnecessary drama for Jesus. That's humility. When you want something so bad, yet you don't become so consumed by what you want that you stop thinking about the good of others. It does not have to be my way. Can y'all say, Gerald, it ain't got to be your way. No, say it out loud, Gerald, it ain't got to be your way. I got one for you. It ain't got to be your way either. Yeah. Do you remember that story about Naaman, the Syrian officer? He had leprosy. Went to the prophet Elisha for help. Naaman almost missed his blessing because he felt put down by Elisha. He thought Elisha should have come outside the house and waved his hands or done something special because he is an elite Syrian officer. But Elisha didn't even come out. He sent word through a servant, told him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And when you dip seven times in the Jordan River, you'll be made clean again. And here this name and this Syrian officer gets up and said, not uptight because he says, who wants to dip in the muddy Jordan River? Surely he can give me something better to do. And his attendants came upon him and said, if he had told you to do something magnificent, would you want to do that? You better go do it and get your blessing. And Naaman went out to the Jordan River and he dipped in the waters seven times. And the Bible says when he came up the seventh time his skin was restored and here it is if you want to catch this his skin was as smooth as a baby's butt that's ought to tell you something because a baby's butt is smooth now that's not trying to be lewd it's trying to be truthful that when God is at work great things can happen but Naaman almost missed his blessing because of pride the centurion in our text was the opposite of Naaman he humbled himself sent word to Jesus. Jesus, don't even come. I'm not worthy. This man is humble. But that's not what amazed Jesus. What was it then that amazed Jesus? Beginning at the second part of verse 7, the centurion says to Jesus, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Oh, did y'all hear that? But say the word, and my servant will be healed. He goes on, for I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. The centurion, again, was an outsider to Israel's re religiously speaking and nationally speaking and racially speaking, but he was an insider concerning the revelation he had received about Jesus. He had not gone to Sunday school. He'd not attended Bible study. He'd not gone to seminary or Bible college or anything like that, but he heard about Jesus. I can just stop right there. I can just shout right there. He heard about Jesus. He never seen Jesus, but he heard about Jesus. There's a song that says, it's amazing to me all the things you've done for me, and I've never seen your face. I went upstairs last night, and I started looking over this message, and I got to this point, and I just opened up the, the, the blinds and looked outside, and I said, I've never seen you. But you take so great care of me. I don't know what you look like, but you've been so good to me. I, I, have you ever been to a place where you got hallelujah happy and thank you, Jesus, glad, and simply raise your hand to God and say, God, I'm glad you take care of me the way you do. I don't have to know what you look like. I'm just glad to be a part of your family. Based on what the centurion heard, he made the connection that although he, with his rank, had influenced 
possessed and his, and his influence, he had influenced and he possessed some power, he understood based on what he heard that Jesus has all power. And with such power, all Jesus had to do was say the word uh, and his servant would be healed. Um, do you remember back in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, Jesus got into Simon Peter's boat and told him to go out for a catch. Y'all remember that? Simon offered up a little protest. He said, well, we've been out fishing all last night, and we didn't catch one thing. But you, you're a preacher. we fishermen. You ought to stick to preaching, and we'll stick to fishing. But Jesus, at your word, because you said it, I'm going to do it. Has anybody in here learned that about life? That when Jesus says something, we can argue with Jesus all we want to argue with Jesus. But have you found that when we obey his word, we look back and say, oh, now I get it. Peter said, at your word, I'll do it. And Simon and them caught so many fish that their nets began to tear. Why? Because there's power in Jesus' word. Jesus spoke to the dangerous fever in Simon's mother-in-law's mother body. And guess what happened? The fever dropped, and she got up and began to serve. Why? Because there's power in his word. Jesus told a paralyzed man that his sins were forgiven. And to prove that he meant what he said, Jesus commanded the man to get up, take up his mat, and go home. And that's exactly what happened. Why? Because there's power in his word. You ought to nudge somebody to tell them there's power in Jesus' word. There's power in Jesus' word. Jesus told a man with a withered hand in Luke chapter 6 to hold out his hand. The man held out his hand and it was fully restored. Why? Because there's power in Jesus' word. Do y'all remember when Jesus was out there on the sea? He went to the back of the boat and went to sleep. Do y'all remember that? And then a dangerous winds and waves started to kick up. And then all the disciples got nervous and ran back to Jesus and said, Master, don't you even care that we're about to perish? And Jesus got up and wiped his eyes and walked over and looked up at the sky and looked at the waters. He said, Peace, be still. And what happened? The winds and the waves obeyed him. Why? Because there's power in his word. Nudge the person on the other side of you and tell them there's power in his word. Uh, the centurion heard about what Jesus could do. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So he sent his friends with one simple request. Jesus, just say the word. Y'all notice what he didn't do. He didn't come up with a lot of catchphrases. He, he didn't come up with long syntax of how he thought he could get Jesus' attention. He, he didn't say, thou who sittest high and reigns above the stars in the sky, the one who causes the sun to shine, the one who causes the moon to sit up high at the night. He, he didn't say, the one who blows upon the wars and calls the waves to push forward. He didn't say to the one who put the little fish in the sea and the one who gave the dog his bark, rough, rough. He didn't do any of that. He just said, tell him, Jesus just say the word. That's all you have to do. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. There it is right there. What amazed Jesus was not the man's high-ranking status. It was not his honorable accomplishments. It was not that he possessed the ability to feel hurt, especially from someone often overlooked. It was not even his sincere humility that he showed. What amazed Jesus is right there in verse 9. It's right there in verse 9 which says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Can the church say great faith? What amazed Jesus about this man was the man's great faith. The message paraphrase says it this way. Taken aback, Jesus addressed the accompanying crowd. I've yet to come across this kind of simple trust anywhere in Israel. The very people who are supposed to know about God and how he works. Faith. Can the church say faith? 
the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Can the church say faith? Brothers and sisters, faith is not complicated. Amen? It's not complicated. Faith does not focus on the details of how Jesus will work things out. I'm trying to help somebody. Because if there anybody in here other than me who's ever had a situation in your life and you were trying to add up everything, you pulled the calculator out. You were pulling everything. You were all on the floor, rolling around on the floor. You were trying to figure out all the details. Go ahead and be honest about it. Go ahead and just raise your hand and say, yeah, I've been there, done that, got the hat, the T-shirt. Yes, you ever been to a place where you just trying, you got a phone call. Your day was going the way you wanted to go. You got a phone call, and on the other side, somebody said something that totally messed up your day, and your mind started racing. Do this with me. This is what it looks like when your mind starts racing, and you start trying. Your day was fine until then, but now you heard something. Oh, okay. Okay, let's put it this way. Maybe you were having a great day, was gone all day, came back home, pulled up in the driveway, went to the mailbox. You were having a great day till you peel, pulled that bill out. Open it up and read that bill. Anybody in here other than me ever been to a place where you started scratching your head and before you in the, you in the driveway, just got the mail. And before you got to the house, you done tried to figure out all the details how you were going to handle that mail you got in the mailbox. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about some stuff, but there's a difference in being concerned and worried. Oh, I didn't got hallelujah happy and thank you, Jesus, glad because I've learned to let go of my worries. I've learned to take my problems to Jesus, knowing that he knows how to work them out. If Jesus has ever worked something out in your life, go ahead and raise your hand and say, thank you, God, for working it out. I didn't understand all the details, but I thank you for working it out. Randy Harris, we've been praying for you. Good to see you. You were down for a while, but you look good with your bad self. Good to see you in here. We couldn't figure out the details, but the God we serve worked it out. Think about God and how he's worked some stuff out in your life. Don't be cute. Write it down on your sermon notes. Circle it. Wave it in the air. Say, God, thank you for working out the details. Faith doesn't focus on the details of how Jesus will work things out. Faith rather focuses with simple childlike trust in the fact that Jesus can work it out. The question before us then is whatever we're going through, whatever challenges and struggles and persecutions we're facing today, the question is simple. Do we trust Jesus or not? That's, that's where it goes. Do, do we trust Jesus or not? The centurion trusted Jesus. Again, what is it that you are facing today? What is it that you are going through today? Or what is it that that person or those people who you love so much that they're going through? And y'all have been trying to figure out all the details. What is it? Whatever it is, be honest about it. Tell God I'm struggling with this. But did y'all hear what I said? I said, tell God I'm struggling with this. Before you tell pastor, before you tell deacon, before you tell the missionary, the trustee, before you call mom or daddy, Uncle Buck or Aunt Watusi, talk to Jesus. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him about all your troubles. He will hear your faintest cry. He'll answer by and by. You'll feel a little prayer wheel turning. And you'll know a little fire is burning. 
I came in here to tell you what I tried for myself. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. How do I know? The text says in verse 10, it says, Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Let's not miss something. The servant said to Jesus, Say the word. My servant will be healed. Notice that the text does not say Jesus said anything. Uh, Reverend King, here's, here's you. All I'm saying is that when we pray, we can't tell Jesus how to answer prayer. We, we just take it to the Lord, leave it there, and let him do what only he can do. Isn't that what we do? The sister senator is uh, Alfonso doing all right. He, he, he had surgery on his knee. And, and sister senator, she, she wasn't stressing. She just let me know what's going on and asked for prayer. He's recovering now. I brought that up because it's important to know that whatever it is that we're facing, Nothing is too big and nothing is too small for God. The, don't miss this. The centurion stayed home with his servant. He sent others to take word to Jesus. But he stayed home with his lowly servant. He was anticipating that once Jesus got the word, he wanted to be right there so he could shout when his servant got up out of that bed. And has anybody in here ever shouted when God answered your prayer? Has anybody in here gotten beyond trying to be cute? Have you ever gotten one of those blessings that, that when you got it, you, you tried to sit there and act nice and act dignified, but when he moved in your life, you just couldn't sit still no longer. Have you ever tried to sit down on your blessing? Have you ever just sat there and crossed your legs and then the kids start singing and then you cross the other leg and then you hear a prayer and then you start squirming in your seat and then you start thinking about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for you and the next thing you know, you are up on your feet and you won't thinking about who was sitting beside you. You didn't care about who was sitting beside you because God has been too good for us to try to act like God is not moving in our lives. So if he's moving in your life, I'm not going to tell you to turn and tell nobody nothing. I'm not going to tell you to get up out of your seat. But you have permission to praise God however you see fit. If you want to bow your head and say, thank you, Jesus, go ahead and do that. If you want to stand up and lift up holy hands, do that. If you just want to rock in your seat, feel free to do that. But whatever you got to do, give them praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hallelujah in the house.